Hello, and welcome back to Notes. Today, we are starting on the reproductive system. We are just going over the anatomical anatomy of the reproductive system with a little bit of physiology, but not much. Mostly just anatomy today. What things look like and what functions they serve. Our next PowerPoint will be over development of the child and childbirth with a little bit of what happens to the reproductive system over time and how you can prevent childbirth and the development of the child. But today, just anatomical parts. Reproductive system, the main thing that we talk about are the gonads, which are testes in males and ovaries in females, as well as the ways that those are able to mix, such as the penis in males and the vagina and uterus in the females. Gonads produce gametes, which are the names for sex cells, and secrete hormones. Males produce sperm, while females produce ova, which are eggs. We'll start with the males. Male reproductive system has the testes as well as the duct system, the epididymis, the duct, ductus, also called the vas deferens, and the urethra. Accessory organs, seminal vesicles, prostate, and bulbourethral glands with the external genitalia being the penis and the scrotum. Here is a section where you can see all the different parts. You can see the testes, scrotum, and epididymis down at the bottom, leading up and over to the seminal vesicle and the ejaculatory duct, while also having the bulbourethral gland, which all then go out through the penis in the spongy urethra. Here's the same thing, but instead of a side view, a top-down view. This is the side view of the testes. Each testes has many different lobules. Each lobule contains one to four seminiferous tubules. These are sperm-forming factories. You make many different amounts of sperm throughout your entire life. The sperm travels through the reet testes to the epididymis and the interstitial cells in the seminiferous tubules then produce androgens such as testosterone. During spermatogenesis, which is the name of uh, how you produce sperm, like it's I said each seminiferous tubule functions as a sperm forming factory. You produce several million sperm per day, about 1,500 every single second, unless you are a girl, in which that number is zero per day, which is about zero per second. So here, you can see each of these lobules, and each of these lobules contains many different seminiferous tubules. Duct system. How do these sperm make it out of the body? The three ducts you have are the epididymis, the ductus vas deferens, and the urethra. Epididymis is a comma-shaped, tightly coiled cube found on the superior 
and along the posterior lateral side of the testes. They function to mature and store sperm cells because once sperm cells are formed in the seminiferous tubules, they can take almost a month, at least 20 days. Some can take up to 40 to 45 days to mature and store sperm cells. And they also help expel the sperm during ejaculation. So here you can see on the back part, the beginning of this sort of tan, you see the yellow seminiferous tubule go to the orange root testes and then empty into the epididymis, which will then run into the vas deferens. Vas deferens carries the sperm from the epididymis to the ejaculatory duct, passes through the inguinal canal and over the bladder. Like I said before, that passes in front of the bladder, but then over and behind the bladder as well. Move sperm by peristalsis, the rhythmic squeezing. Spermatic cord is the ductus deferens, the blood vessels, and the nerves in a connective tissue sheath. So here you see the very back part of the testes contains the vas deferens. And as it goes up and out of the testes and scrotum, you see it also joins with blood vessels and nerves in the spermatic cord. Vas deferens terminates in the ejaculatory duct, which unites with the urethra. Expanded end is called the ampulla. Ejaculation, smooth muscles in the walls, the De duct deferens, ductus deferens, vas deferens, create peristaltic waves to squeeze the sperm forward. One major way of birth control is called a vasectomy, in which you cut the vas deferens. In cutting the vas deferens, it is the only way that the sperm can escape and get into the ejaculatory duct. If you cut this and cauterize it shut, the sperm have no way of escaping the testes, and therefore, in theory, there should be zero chance of causing birth. The urethra, after it escapes the vas deferens, sperm enters the urethra. This is the part in which you get semen as well, which we'll talk about in a second, what, how sperm and semen are different. Urethra, as we discussed in the previous chapter, also carries urine. However, sperm and urine do not form at the same place. Therefore, they do not have the exact same path. I don't remember... Okay, we're gonna to go to a previous picture where it's easier to see. So here you can see, about the center, you see the urethra. Beneath that, you see the pink going down, out of the bladder, down to the base of the penis, and then out the penis as well. However, sperm do not join it there. Sperm pass through the vas deferens, and the ampulla. I do not think, nope, I do not have access to a pen. So I cannot show you, but hopefully you can see how this cord passes over the bladder and then out behind the back of the bladder and then joins in the prostate, which is that little circle beneath the bladder. So as you can see, urine and sperm do not exit at the same place. Or they do not enter the urethra at the same place, I should say. They exit at the same place, but they do not enter the urethra at the same place. All right, let's get back to where we were. Here we go. Regions of the urethra, prostatic urethra, membranous urethra, and spongy urethra. Prostatic urethra is surrounded by the prostate. Membranous urethra travels from the prostate to the penis, and spongy urethra 
runs the length of the penis. So here you can see prosthetic urethra, the part of the urethra that looks like it's surrounded by an onion or clove of garlic. Here is also where the sperm join. Then it travels to the membranous urethra, the base of the penis, and then the rest, most of the urethra, is this spongy urethra, which travels the length of the penis. There are three main accessory organs, seminal vesicles, prostate, and bulbourethral glands. Here you can see the seminal vesicles are little ducts, little glands that are right next to the ampulla of the ductus deferens, of the vas deferens. Prostate is the little garlic or onion looking thing beneath the bladder. And bulbourethral glands are beneath the prostate gland. It is easier to see them with the side view. So we're going back to the side view. Here we go. So here you can see, oh, I can do that. Here you can see the seminal vesicles, which then lead to the prostate. And then beneath that, you have the bulbourethral gland, which looks like a little pea. First up, we have the seminal vesicles, located at the base of the bladder. Produces a thick, yellowish secretion, which is 60% of the semen. This yellow secretion contains fructose, which is sugar, vitamin C, prostaglandins, and other substances that nourish and activate the sperm. Prostate, which trickles the upper part of the urethra, secretes a milky fluid, helps to activate the sperm, and it enters the urethra through several small ducts. If you have inflammation of the prostate, that is prostatitis. And the third most common cancer in males is prostate cancer. Right here beneath the bladder. And finally, bulbourethral glands. Pea-sized glands inferior to the prostate produces a thick, clear mucus that helps cleanse the urethra of acidic urine prior to ejaculation. Sperm do not like acidic environments. Unfortunately, uric acid is an acid, so that leads to an acidic environment, as well as the vaginal canal is also an acidic environment. So, as well as cleansing the urethra of acidic urine prior to ejaculation, it also serves as a lubricant during sexual intercourse that serves as a also semi-protection from the acidic environment of the vaginal canal. <coughs> this is secreted directly into the penile urethra, into the spongy urethra. As you can see here, you have your seminal vesicle and your prostate that form here at this top Y. However, the bulbourethral gland does not join until the base of the penis at a different area. Semen is a mixture of sperm and accessory gland secretions. Sperm is just the cells that are used in reproduction. Semen is a mixture of this sperm as well as the secretions of the seminal vesicles, the prostate, and the bulbourethral glands. Advantages of these secretions, the fructose provides energy for the sperm cells. They got a long way to swim. They need as much energy as they can. The semen is alkaline, which helps neutralize the acidic environment of the vagina, helps keep those sperm alive. Semen also inhibits bacterial multiplication, keeps them from getting infected. And elements of semen enhance sperm motility, make it easier for the sperm to move. <coughs> External genitalia, scrotum and penis. Why 
do you have to store your testes outside of your body? Because it maintains at three degrees lower than normal body temperature. This helps protect sperm viability. That little bit of lower temperature, which three, uh, three degrees Celsius is about five degrees Fahrenheit. So your body is about 98, 97 to 99 degrees Fahrenheit normally. The testes are stored at about 92 to 94 degrees Fahrenheit. That little bit of a lower body temperature helps the sperm stay alive longer. And then penis. Deliver sperm to the reproductive tract. You have the shaft, the glands, penis, and the prepuce, which is the foreskin. Normally, this is removed by circumcision. However, depending on the culture, it may or may not be removed. The uh, Americans, people in America, North and South America, as well as those of the Jewish faith, are much more likely to go through circumcision than <coughs> people from Asia, Africa, or Europe. Unless, of course, they are of the Jewish faith or some others, such as I believe, uh, of course, uh, Christianity following Judaism tends to follow the Judy the Judaic uh, idea of circumcision. I believe M Muslims and Islam also follows it, but I'm not 100% sure about that. External genitalia. Internally, there are three areas of spongy erectile tissue around the urethra. Erection occurs when this tissue fills with blood and other fluids during sexual excitement. Same thing as when you throw water in a water balloon. Throwing that fluid tends to make it enlarge, and since it can't expand a whole amount, it tends to ex extend outward instead of uh, side by side. Although it does intent sometimes enlarge side by side, the main way that uh, it functions is to help uh, extend and harden the penis for an erection, which makes it easier for the sperm to escape since during an erection, the urethra is not folded over and is held open. Much easier for sperm to make it outside of the body. Spermatogenesis is production of sperm cells. Begins at puberty and continues throughout life. Sperm that you create do not last longer than two months. So you are creating sperm continually throughout your entire life, if you're a male. If you're a female, you don't create sperm. This occurs in the seminiferous tubules as we talked. Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of time to talk about spermatogenesis because it is a shortened class period. However, I will be showing the slides that we have on it so that you can at least learn about it. So you go through meiosis, which is the forming of the sex cells. One cell becomes four cells. In males, you produce sperm. In females, you produce eggs. When these join, you get fertilization, produces a zygote. And then through mitosis and development, you get a fully formed human being, and then male and female will then lead to further fertilization. Each of the gametes, the egg and the sperm, contains half of the total genetic material so that when they join, you join their total genetic material, and that makes a 46 chromosome human. Normally, 46 chromosome human. Of course, you can get different genetic disorders such as Turner syndrome, in which it's only 45, as they only have a single X chromosome. So Turner syndrome only happens in females. Kleinfelters, in which you have an XXY male, 47 chromosomes, as well as Down syndrome is 47 chromosomes. Three copies of chromosome 21. 
Those are the main that you get. You can also get a trisomy 18. Down syndrome is trisomy 21, three copies of chromosome 21. You also get trisomy 18, which is three copies of chromosome 18. I don't off the top of my head know the name of that. Uh, Edwards syndrome is trisomy 18. And apparently there's also a trisomy 13, which is called Patau syndrome. I do not know what these do. I do not know much about Edwards or Patau syndrome, so that could be something you could look up. Patau is P-A-T-A-U. Parts of the sperm, head, midpiece, tail, head contains genetic material, Midpiece contains a lot of mitochondria to produce the energy for swimming, and tail is used for swimming, as you can see here. Head contains the nucleus. Midpiece contains a lot of mitochondria, and then the tail helps for swimming. Here's a picture of what sperm actually look like under a microscope. It is the only flagellated cell in the human body. We have many ciliated cells, little tiny hair-like projections. However, this is the only cell in the human body that uses those hair-like projections, in this case, a single hair-like projection, for movement, in which case it has a flagella. One huge thing the testes do produce is testosterone. This is produced in the interstitial cells. During puberty, LH, luteinizing hormone, activates these, in turn, testosterone is produced. It functions by stimulating reproductive organ development, underlies the sex drive. Once you undergo this large amount of testosterone in your body, you have a larger desire uh, and attraction to the opposite sex, as well as causing secondary sex characteristics. Deepening of the voice, increased hair growth, enlargement of the skeletal muscles, and thickening of the bones. So here is something that shows exactly how it is done. Hypothalamus releases the gonadotropin-releasing hormone, which then stimulates the uh, cells to release LH and FSH, which then lead to releasing testosterone, which then has all these primary and secondary sex characteristics. Now we're done with a male. Let's talk about the female reproductive system. You have ovaries, duct system, fallopian tubes, uterus and vagina, as well as the external genitalia. Here's a side view of the female reproductive system. Ovaries, composed of ovarian follicles, each follicle consists of an oocyte, which is an immature egg, and the follicular cells, which surround the oocyte. This is a very large drawing of what an ovary would look like. You can see all these different, all these different follicles and oocytes, and eventually you get ovulation, where you release them. We will talk about that. You have the primary follicle, contains an immature oocyte. The vesicular follicle, which is the growing follicle, which you can see here at the top. The primary, which is immature, and then the growing, where they grow larger and larger and develop further. Oh, whoops. Now I have to go back all the way to the beginning a bit. That's okay. We will go back. Ovulation is when the egg is mature. The follicle ruptures. This occurs about every 28 days. Hence why your cycle or you tend to get your period or your menstruation about every 28 days. Because that is the cycle at which you release an egg. However, 
The period does not happen at the same time as ovulation. We will talk about that, I believe, in the next lesson. But we might talk about it at the end of this one. I don't remember. And then the ruptured follicle, now that you've released the egg, this is transformed into a corpus luteum. The corpus luteum is then eventually disposed of. Support for ovaries, the suspensory ligaments help secure the ovary to the walls of the pelvis, the ovarian ligaments attached to the uterus, and then you have the broad ligaments. These help maintain the position of the ovary and the fallopian tubes to make sure that none of them get a kink in it that would eventually cause the egg to not be able to travel down to the uterus. Duct system, fallopian tubes, uterus, and vagina. Fallopian or uterine tubes, they receive the oocyte. This is also where you get fertilization. Fertilization almost never happens in the uterus itself. Almost every single time you get fertilization in the fallopian tubes. They attach to the uterus at the anterior point. Little to no contact is between the ovaries and the uterine tubes. And these are supported and closed by the broad ligaments. As you can see in the picture here, it looks like these little finger-like projections of the tubes are touching the ovary. However, there is always at least a little bit of space between them. They do not actually ever touch. What we call those little finger-like projections are the fimbriae. They receive the oocyte from the ovary. The cilia, located inside the uterine tubes, they beat continuously toward the uterus that help move the oocyte towards the uterus. It takes about three to four days. And fertilization occurs inside the uterine tube since oocyte lives about 24 hours. Let's talk about the uterus. Located between the urinary bladder and the rectum. So you have the bladder, then the uterus, and then the large intestine and rectum. It is a hollow organ. Obviously, if you're gonna have a baby in it, you don't want anything in it. So it's a hollow organ. Functions, it receives, retains, and nourishes the egg. It receives it, it holds on to it, and if it is a fertilized egg, it then nourishes it. If it is not a fertilized egg, it's flushed out. Support for it, you have these three ligaments, broad, round, and uterosacral ligaments. Hold the uterus in place. You have the body, the main portion. The fundus is the superior region where the uterine tube enters, and then the cervix, narrow outlet that protrudes and empties into the vagina. Walls. Endometrium, myometrium, and parametrium. Endometrium is the inner layer. This is what is lost during menstruation. It allows for the implantation of fertilized egg. If the egg is not fertilized when it reaches the uterus, the entire endometrium is lost through menstruation. The myometrium is the middle layer of smooth muscle. This is what allows you to squeeze the baby out later. as well as, of course, voluntary skeletal muscle. But when you start having contractions, these are the muscles that cause contractions, since obviously contractions are not controlled by you. And the parametrium, outermost layer that is kind of just holds the uterus together. It is the visceral peritoneum. So here you can see endometrium, this thin little pink line here, the myometrium, this thick muscle, and then the outside, the parametrium. The vaginal canal extends from the cervix to the exterior of the body. Located between bladder and rectum, it also serves as the birth canal, as well as receiving the penis during sexual intercourse. The hymen also partially closes the vagina until it is ruptured. However, it does not have to be ruptured either during uh, 
sexual maturity, or even during sex. There are many people and many times that have said it can rupture at almost any time that it receives anything rough, such as if you're riding, going horseback riding. That sometimes is enough to tear the hymen, which will then break it. Just because it is broken does not mean that it is dangerous. If it is broken, normally you just would go to either a regular doctor or if you have an OBGYN appointment coming up, talk to them about it as long as it hasn't gotten infected. It should be fine. The external genitalia, such as mons pubis, labia, clitoris, urethral orifice, vaginal orifice, and greater vestibular glands. Mons pubis is the fatty area overlying the pubic symphysis. So where your pelvic bones meet in the front, the fatty, the fat and the skin overlying that is the mons pubis. This is the portion that has the main amount of pubic hair after puberty. Labia are the skin folds, the labia majora and labia minora. Labia majora are hair-covered skin folds that enclose the labia minora. Labia minora are delicate hair-free folds of skin on the interior of the labia majora. Vestibule and greater vestibular glands, enclosed also by the labia majora, contains external openings of the urethra and the vagina. Greater vestibular glands, one is found on each side of the vagina. These secrete lubricant during intercourse that aid with the bulbourethral gland secretions to provide a lubricant as well as help negate the acidic environment of the vagina. The clitoris contains erectile tissue. It corresponds to the male penis. However, unlike the male penis, it does not enlarge for use in uh, secreting semen. It is, however, composed of erectile tissue that during sexual excitement, it can become swollen with blood like the penis. And it can... Uh, receive a lot of that sexual stimulation as well as the penis. And finally, you have the perineum, which is the diamond-shaped region between the anterior ends of the labial folds, the anus posteriorly, and the ischial tuberosities laterally. So here we have the mom's pubis up here where Normally, you would have the pelvic bones meeting in the front. You have the mom's pubis area that you grow most of hair during puberty. You then have the labia majora, which are the large lips on the outside. Labia is, I believe, Latin for lips. You have labia on the outside as well as the labia minora, which are the thin lips on the inside. <coughs> you then have the clitoris up here, which corresponds to the male penis, as well as the vestibule urethral opening, and then anterior to that, you have the vaginal opening, as well as surrounded on both sides with, come on, the vestibular glands. Then you have the perineum, which is this dotted diamond area and the anus at the back. Oogenesis in the ovarian cycle. All the eggs that a woman will have are present at her birth, which means for a short amount of time, your grandmother carried part of you in her as right before her birth, right before your mother's birth, your grandmother 
had your mother in her womb, as well as your mother containing the egg that would eventually become you in her ovaries. The ability to release these eggs begins at puberty. Reproductive ability ends at menopause. At menopause, that means for one reason or another, you have stopped releasing eggs. Oocytes are matured in developing ovarian follicles. Oogonia are stem cells that are found in developing fetus. These eventually become primary oocytes. The oogonia, the stem cells, no longer exist. By the time of birth, all the oogonia have become primary oocytes. Primary oocytes by the time of the child's birth. Normally, if there is for some reason a vastly premature birth such as child born at six and a half or seven months, some of those oogonia may still be there. However, they will then either become oocytes or they will not develop and will lead to an earlier menopause. Most of the time, they will further develop into a more primary oocytes. So, very little uh, disruption is found in premature birth in the ovarian cycle. Primary oocytes are inactive till puberty. Once you release that follicle stimulating hormone, this causes some of the follicles to mature each month and then ovulation. Cyclical monthly changes constitute the ovarian cycle. And then you have the mat maturing of the oocyte, and then the ovulation, the release. Meiosis is completed after ovulation only if there is penetration of the sperm. Unlike sperm in which one cell becomes four, you get meiosis one where one cell becomes two and then it waits. If then that cell is penetrated by the sperm, that cell will then divide again. And that is where you get your uh, fertile egg from. Once the ovum is formed, 23 chromosomes can be combined with the sperm to form the fertilized egg. If the secondary oocyte is not penetrated by a sperm, it dies and does not complete meiosis. Male and female differences. Meiosis in males produces four functional sperm. In females, it produces one functional ovum and three polar bodies. That first division becomes one oocyte and two polar bodies. If it is then fertilized, you get one ovum and one more polar body out of that oocyte. Sperm are very small movable and equipped nutrients. Egg is large, non-movable, and has nutrient reserves to nourish the embryo. <coughs> and that is where we are going to stop. This is where we will begin next week in the menstrual cycle. Talk about menstrual cycle, talk about fertilization, implantation and development of the embryo, and childbirth, as well as ways in which you can prevent childbirth and fertilization.